or load my phone. Um, but I didn't want to start giving a lecture without you being able to see who I am. But nonetheless, uh, I'll start from here. So the first thing that we are going to talk about um, is storage spaces. Um, again, I want to remind everyone that uh, you can ask questions at any time. I will ask uh, Claire and David to monitor the uh, the chat for uh, for Zoom and, and raised hands uh, and interrupt. Uh, I can't see that really right now, but um, please ask at any point. Uh, I'm happy to stop and clarify. Uh, first thing I want to do is give you an overview. Of what are the what are the things that we are trying to do in this uh, uh, in this part of the tutorial? Um, so, what are the questions that we want to answer, and then what are the objectives? Um, so, uh, the first thing is, what are the types and roles of Dune's data volumes? So, uh, we have uh, hard drives, tape volumes, uh, we have network attached storage, all of those things that are places that you can put files uh, and they get stored, but each one has its own specific purpose. It has more bandwidth or more responsiveness or greater volume. Um, and that we want you to make sure to understand how can you access those volumes? What's the best way to use them? What's their purpose? Um, and uh, how to make sure that that gets involved in the in the the ecosystem of Dune computing in an efficient way, so that um, no one ever runs out of resources. Um, they will eventually run out of quota. I'm sure it happens all the time. But so that you are prepared to understand how you need to modify your actions to to overcome that. Um, what are some of the commands and tools that you can use to handle data? Uh, and make sure that you can put uh, files into storage and then get those files back out. Um, so we're going to be uh, trying to understand the data volumes, their properties, display information, and then differentiating the commands to handle data between grid accessible and interactive nodes. Okay. Um, so I'll start. I'll start there. Um, so really, there are. Uh, three different types of storage volumes that you are gonna encounter at Fermilab. Um, one is a local hard drive. Um, so that is a hard drive that is kind of physically attached to the, uh, to the, the server that you are working on. Um, similar to the way that you have a hard drive in your laptop or your, or your desktop machine, that, that hard drive is right next to the processor, right next to the memory, phys kind of physically connected to that. And so there is a lot of fast access that can go on across that. Um, the next type of storage is network attached storage. Um, this is uh, storage that is similarly, mostly a, a hard drive or a RAID array, and it is connected um, uh, across the network. And it's it acts similar to the way that maybe Dropbox or uh, OneDrive acts, or you should kind of think about it in, in that sense. Um, you know, it is a, a storage element that is connected to a lot of servers. And in general, it looks like it's on the local machine, uh, even though it isn't. Um, and then the last type of uh, storage element that we have is kind of the large scale distributed storage. So Dune uh, anticipates that we are going to take about 30,000 uh, 30, terabytes of raw data every year will be written into uh, this large scale distributed storage. Um, so 30 petabytes of data. Uh, and we can't have 30 petabytes of data mounted onto your personal laptop or to um, you know, uh, every single worker node. But nonetheless, we want to have access to all of all, we want to have access to that data in a controlled manner across the network. And so that's a, a type of storage where we are um, using very specific tools and protocols in order to access all of that data. So each of these has its own advantages and limitations. The important thing is knowing which one do you need to use in which situation. It isn't necessarily um, at all straightforward or obvious, but at the same time, with a little bit of thought and a little bit of understanding, um, we can make sure that, that you know which one is the right one to use for your situation. Um, and that will help make sure that everyone is efficiently accessing all of, uh, all of those storage elements. Um, a couple of vocabulary terms uh, before we, we go forward. Um, the first one is what is immutable. Um, one of the interesting things uh, with some of these uh, uh, storage elements, 
they work in a manner such that once you write a file into the storage element, it now becomes immutable, meaning that the file itself actually cannot be changed. Um, what you can do is you can read the file back um, and get the access that's there. You could delete the file, change the red copy that's on your local interactive node or on your laptop, and then write it back to the storage element at the same location. But the interesting thing is, is you can't use a real-time editor to, uh, to modify an immutable uh, file. Um, so the thing to pay attention with is whether or not a storage element that you're working on, is, does it have that property where a file on that, on that storage element in that area is an unmutable? So uh, such, a, um, such a storage element would be a really poor choice for downloading uh, a Git repository to do code modification or updates on. Um, because once you write that, that GitHub repository onto that storage element, you can only read it. You, can't, you would then have to take the file, copy it someplace else, modify it, delete the copy on the storage element, and the copy it back. So that's an example of something that's a little bit complicated. Um, similarly, the question of what is an interactive or a POSIX uh, type of volume. So there are interactive volumes that have POSIX access. When I say POSIX, what I mean is that you can directly read, write, modify, and you can also use all of the standard Unix commands that you're used to using LS uh, and uh, DF, uh, all of those commands that you can think of within a bash shell or within um, a C shell or whichever one you're using, all of those are available and function as you would expect on a, a POSIX um, volume. And one of the things to think about is, uh, okay, I'm accessing yeah, this, sorry. this volume. Uh, yep. Sorry, I'm reading, I'm reading a question and this is pretty important. So could you explain what is exactly a worker node? Thank you. Ah, what is a worker node? Okay, great. That's a wonderful question. Um, so a worker node is a, um, a, a computing node uh, that is located somewhere on uh, the wide area network um, that has been configured to allow um, batch processing jobs to uh, log into that node and then start running a program for um, a, a user that has submitted a large number of uh, jobs or tasks. So um, later in the uh, in the tutorial, we'll learn about what Larsoft is. Larsoft is a, an, anal a, a, uh, an analysis framework uh, piece of software um, that works on Liquid Argon. Uh, that's, that's the LAR and soft, Liquid Argon software. So if you wanted to reconstruct uh, a muon in a detector or simulate a muon in a detector, Larsoft is a piece of piece of software that you could use to do that. Um, say if you wanted to run a million events, you wouldn't want to do that on one, one node, on one computer that would take too long, but instead you go out to the open science grid or the, um, uh, the, the worldwide uh, LHC computing grid, the WLCG, um, and there are worker nodes distributed literally around the world uh, that will accept your submitted job, process uh, the task that you have designed and then send you back your, your output. So when I talk about a worker node, it is uh, a node on a computing grid distributed somewhere around the world. It could be in um, uh, somewhere in the US, it could be somewhere in, in Europe, uh, India, uh, literally anywhere in the world. Thank you. I wrote down on the document what you said. Like, thanks. You type much faster than I do, but thank you very much. So, um, <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and the question of uh, what is meant by grid accessible? So this is the question of whether or not a worker node uh, can access a volume. So uh, a very, uh, uh, maybe a very simple example is a worker node, um, cannot see the data on the hard drive of my laptop. 
or on the data of the hard drive of your laptop, right? Um, and just as the same as if uh, you borrow uh, your, your, um, your office mate's laptop, they don't have access to the things that are stored on your laptop. At the same time, if you are using something uh, like Dropbox or OneDrive, now all of a sudden your laptop could record data to, to OneDrive or to Dropbox. And now that file, if you logged in correctly on your office mate's laptop could have access to that Dropbox um, uh, file. So there are certain volumes that are in fact available on uh, a, a a worker node, um, but their access mechanism is different. So it's not, it, it is, uh, I am using Dropbox or OneDrive as an analogy. The actual mechanism itself is completely different. Um, and we'll go into some of those access me mechanisms, but that is what we mean by grid accessible. Um, and it, it's one of the one of the key elements that we, we'd like to get across to you is the idea of if I am working interactively and I save a file onto this one storage element, will my job on a grid worker node still have access to that file? And in what way will it have access to that file? So I'm, I'll pause right here and just ask if anybody has any questions. Um, I'm going to look in the chat, but and raise so far, nothing on the chat. Nothing. I'm looking. Okay, through. everything yeah. is crystal clear. Wonderful. Well, we'll, we'll see. But I keep a note on the on the document. Thanks for those. There are twenty more than thirty people on the doc on the live document. So great. That's cool. excellent. So the the first thing that we want to talk about is um, in the setup exercises. One of the things that you did was you logged into uh, the Dune GPVM. So a the the Dune part, you probably recognize that the GPVM uh, may have no meaning for you. It is a general purpose virtual machine. Um, it is just, it's a little bit of lingo, um, but those are the interactive nodes that we use uh, within the Dune collaboration to do our code development, to submit our jobs, um, the, the interactive computing. Um, and on those interactive uh, nodes, there are kind of uh, three main types of storage volumes that I want to talk to you about. Um, one is the home area. So when you log in to um, one of the interactive nodes, in general, uh, your shell opens up, you log in, and you end up in the home area. Uh, this is very similar to a user's local hard drive uh, on uh, your laptop, but it is actually network mounted. Some of the nice things about it, it is very fast access speed, um, uh, and there can be a high high volume of access to the, the home area. It is designed to handle hundreds, if not thousands of users across uh, all of the interactive nodes accessing that volume at the same time. Um, and it has uh, a full POSIX access. So you really can treat it like your local hard drive. One of the things that you should know though, is because it is going across the network, it is not safe to store your certificates or your tickets there. Um, this is because basically a certificate uh, or your ticket is in general, a um, uh, is considered a password. So I think Steve has a point of clarification. Yes, yes. There was a time when this network had had storage with Mona and all the worker nodes too. And we had to stop it because we couldn't take all that load. So yes, uh, we, we had to get rid of that very quickly. So yeah, it's only available in the interactive nodes now. Yeah. So um, the next point, which, which Steve mentions, is this is not accessible as an output location from grid worker nodes. Um, not only is uh, the next point important, it has uh, it only has a size of about two gigabytes. So you really can't store that much data there, but it is not accessible from a grid worker node. So if you put a file or a script on your home area, it will only work in the interactive nodes. At the same time, you use the same home area for a Dune GPVM as you would for a Microboon or a Minerva or um, a Nova 
or mu to e, g minus two, any of those uh, interactive nodes at Fermilab all use the same home area. So again, um, it's a very small area. Uh, you have a, a very limited quota, so you shouldn't do code development there, but you can put scripts there, which are going to be kilobytes in size. They're just plain text. Um, you do need a valid Kerberos ticket in order to access files in your home area. Um, and the nice thing is, is that periodic snapshots are taken so that you can recover deleted files. So if you go into this area, uh, slash NAS home, slash dot snapshot, you can start to look for old files that you have accidentally deleted. Now there is a limit on the size of a snapshot, so it will not go back 12 months, but it certainly should go back uh, 24 hours so that if you need to recover something, you can go back and look, look for that. The next area is locally mounted volumes. So these are in fact local physical disks that are mounted directly, meaning that they're not mounted over the network. Um, and they have direct links to the dev location in general, they're used for temporary storage for infrastructure services. They're in like slash bar slash temp, and they can be used to store certificates and tickets. Um, in general, they're saved there automatically with uh, owner read permission, uh, and, and no one else can look at them or see them. So you won't have to think about it. But if you do end up in a situation where you have come up with a unique workflow where you want a very specific ticket or certificate, it is, um, that is the location where you should store it. Say you, for whatever reason, um, uh, had a certificate from your home institution um, and you needed that to access a data volume uh, back at your home institution that had a very specific certificate, putting it in um, slash temp uh, would be the, the correct place to do that. Um, in general, you really, um, it's rare that you will need access to that, um, but at the same time, I wanted because I have pointed out that your home area is not safe for certificates. I felt obligated to make sure to mention this is the one place that you can store uh, certificates. And then the last um, interactive volume that I wanted to talk about is network attached storage, and um, this is a storage element that behaves similar to a locally mounted volume. Um, as I said, it, it acts similar to Dropbox or, or OneDrive. It is fast and stable access rates. Um, they are available on a limited number of computers and servers. Specifically, they are not available to the larger grid computing. Um, and there are three volumes that uh, are available to Dune. They are slash Dune app. Um, and then there are snapshots in this area right here, slash Dune app dot snapshot. Um, Dune data and Dune data two. The important thing to note is that the Dune app area does have periodic snapshots, but the Dune data and Dune data two do not. So if you are doing code development, if you are doing uh, writing of scripts, uh, job submission, uh, configuration, things like that, in general, doing that in Dune app is a pretty good idea because there are snapshots and recoveries. If you have end tuples, um, then putting those uh, temporarily in Dune Data or Dune Data 2 would be a little bit better idea. Um, the, the idea being that generating an end tuple, you should have a script on Dune app that can help you regenerate that end tuple, end tuple quickly uh, or reprocess that data quickly. But the actual construction of the script itself, that's where all of your, uh, all of your knowledge and your effort has gone. Um, and, and that's the thing that is most pre precious, right? I, uh, I can, um, uh, I can re-download uh, Billie Eilish's new song that she just premiered on Stephen Colbert, but uh, that's not the thing that's important. It's remembering what my, uh, what my Apple ID password is, uh, right? So that's, that's the analogy I'm trying to make here is that the scripts that you write, the software you develop, those important things go, can go on Duna app and there are snapshots to recover that. The actual digital data itself put that on Dune Data or Dune Data 2, th there won't be a recovery of that, but the information you need to recover is stored on Dune app in your working area. So now it's kind of a big change uh, and we're gonna start talking about grid accessible storage volumes. Um, so there are uh, a couple of different types, a few different types of large scale uh, storage volumes at Fermilab. Um, there's a specific technology that, that we use. Uh, those two technologies are Dcache and NStore. 
Um, they are basically a software layer on top of either large arrays of uh, disk drives uh, for Dcache, and then NStore is a software layer that manages uh, tape storage. I assume that everyone is uh, familiar with the idea of a disk drive. Not everyone may be familiar with the idea of a tape drive. Um, for those of you that are uh, uh, old enough or um, uh, old enough to remember cassette tapes, uh, it is uh, the, the tape drives that we use uh, are not the exact same form factor, but it is the same type of magnetic tape itself uh, that is, has two, two reels within a cassette and it streams tape from one side to the other and records on that magnetic, uh, that magnetic strip uh, the information. Uh, the great thing about tape storage is that it has a, a very large capacity for the price. Um, so we have capacity for more than 100 petabytes of storage um, uh, from the, the tape drive. Uh, the disk uh, in Dcache is not quite as large, but the nice thing is, is that we can use that disk to stage information off of the tapes so that we can then access it quickly uh, through um, uh, network connections uh, and extra D. Uh, that the next comment I was gonna make is that whenever possible, we should access this over extra D. We'll go into that in the next section um, as the mount points on the interactive nodes are slow and very unstable. At the same time, so we have the tape storage and then we have disk drive storage, um, end store being tapes, dcache being disk drives. Within dcache, we actually have several different types. So the most straightforward type of dcache is persistent dcache. Um, the idea is that this is uh, a set of disk drives uh, that have a given capacity and they are assigned to an experiment with that exact amount of capacity. So it might be 100 terabytes, it might be 200 terabytes or 300 terabytes, but in general, the size of that, uh, that cache, that volume is well-defined and doesn't change. Um, and once it is used up, that's it, it is full. You can't, uh, you can't put more information into it. Um, there will be an, an error. The reason we call it persistent is the fact that the data um, in the file uh, is not going to be removed until it is manually deleted by a user. So once you put a file into persistent dcache, it will stay there uh, and it will persistently be available to you no, you know, no matter what, um, unless there is either a hardware failure or you go in and you delete uh, that file. The next type is uh, scratch dcache. Um, and this is a little bit different. It is a large volume and it's shared across all of the experiments. So uh, as I said, Dune, Minerva, Nova, Microboom, <coughs> UDE, G-2, all of them can write to that same dcache area. It's much larger than the persistent dcache. So it might be a petabyte of storage, a thousand terabytes. Um, but the interesting thing is that whenever you write a new file into scratch space, it looks around, finds the file that has been least recently accessed and deletes that file until there is enough space for the new file that you are writing. So this really is a lot more of a cache than the, per this is a cache in, in, in the real sense. Um, every file that gets written causes another file to be deleted. Um, the great thing about that is, is that the newer files will be available and they have a place to go. So you will never end up having an error saying that the Dcache scratch base is full. You can always write files there. Unfortunately, um, sorry. We did fill it up once recently. Oh, I said Gmail too filled it up once recently. Well, they, w the problem is, is that it wasn't that they weren't able to write to it. It was the fact that they had written so much data that it was pushing out the other data before right. people were ever to access to it. So what you can do, and this is a problem, is that we could write one petabyte of data into scratch space in a day, and that would literally remove everything. And then 
there, the only thing that would be remaining in the scratch base was one, one petabyte of data that had been created in the last day. If you did that for two days, it would mean that you had only 24 hours to access a petabyte of data, and that is pretty much an impossible task. Um, so you, th that is the problem, is that um, uh, if you write too much to decast Scratch, you can in fact lose data because, well, we only have a petabyte, and if we wrote two petabytes a day, then we, we just wouldn't have time to read all of it. Um, if you get to the point where you're generating uh, hundreds of terabytes of data, uh, you should be on the Dune production team and we should be uh, talking with you. Um, but nonetheless, um, uh, it is a pretty safe bet to say that if, if you are generating data on the, on the scale of, uh, of one or 10 uh, terabytes, writing that to Scratch Space means that it will be available. You'll have space created for you so that you can write it there and it should be available for between seven and 30 days, most likely 30 days. Um, but every now and again, things go sideways and we only end up with a, a, a retention time of about seven days on, on Decash Scratch. Um, resilient Decash is gonna be deprecated, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip that. Um, the last type of Decash is the tape back Decash. Um, and this is uh, something that's a little bit more complex um, because it involves both the disks of Decash and the tapes of NStore. Um, the idea is, is that we have uh, a small amount of disk, and I say small compared to the tapes that it is servicing. Um, it may still be 100 terabytes of disk, um, but 100 terabytes of disk compared to 100 petabytes of tape, again, the disk is now small even though it's more, more disk than I have uh, in all of the laptops in, in, my, uh, uh, in my department. But the idea is that you would write a file to that disk storage area and NStore and Dcache communicate with each other and they, they take a copy of the file off of the disk and write it into tape and it goes into permanent storage on NStore. Um, they, uh, the nice thing is, is that once a file is written to tape, it is going to be stored forever. Um, that's part of the policy that we have uh, with Fermilab, that uh, the files on tape won't be deleted unless we actively make that choice. Um, the downside is, while it will always be available, um, it will always be, excuse me, it will always be stored. That doesn't necessarily, it will always be immediately available. Because tape drives take longer, um, they physically have to be moved around. Um, uh, I, and they are, because you access a tape, uh, you read files off of it or you write files to it. And once you're done with that, they actually remove it from the tape drive, put it into a library. And then when you want to access it again, a small little robot moves around, physically pulls the tape out, moves it back to the drive, inserts it into the drive, and then you can start to read it. So the interesting thing about tape back decache is that files are not available for immediately for immediate read on disk, but they actually do need to be staged from tape first. And that becomes very important because if you access a data set uh, from a year ago, there is a good chance that those files are not actually on disk at that moment, that 100, 100 terabytes of disk that are interacting with NStore what you would need to do is put in a request to have the robots go get all of the tapes, copy off of tape the data that you want, put it onto the decache disk, and then it will be available for immediate read. So I'll pause here for a moment and let people ask questions and I'm going to take a quick sip of tea. Great, thank you Kirby so far. I see there are some people having a uh, comments, uh, uh, remarks on the Google Doc and um, also some questions. I want to mention that uh, once we have all of these questions on the Google Doc, we will just combine them and uh, make a nice Q&A post tutorial. So stay tuned on this. Great. Uh, yes, Stephen, you have something to say? Yeah, the, when persistent DKS does go full and there will be an nasty email coming from the Fermilab contact saying clean it up. And it is primarily full. Yes. So. 
That is true. Um, you should just put yourself there forever. You should be something you need. Yeah. Um, correct. Uh, one of the problems, uh, and, and I should mention that, uh, persistent decache, because files are never deleted, if you leave a file there for five or six or seven years, um, you will be using up precious space that others would like to use. Um, and so it would be appropriate that instead of having something in persistent decache that you haven't used for five or six years, you could move it to tape back decache where it will be permanently stored and avail it will be permanently stored, won't be deleted, but it doesn't have to be immediately available. Um, it is, uh, yeah. It's like parking in the 15 minute parking uh, and then leaving your car there for six or seven months. It is, uh, it is more than a little rude. Um, and you may in fact get nasty emails and parking tickets, so. Nice comparison. There is an interesting question uh, that is on the document that I would like to ask you right now. Is there any difference between upload download speed between these decaches? Ah. As far as I know, there should not be um, a, a difference in upload and download. Um, uh, decache is fully bidirectional uh, and the routers are, are bidirectional. Um, uh, one of the, there are a number of limitations. Um, so the, if I think about bottlenecks along the way, so there is an ether, excuse me, there's an ethernet cable that goes uh, out of uh, a decache node um, and then into a router. So there is the individual node or pool node um, where a hard drive may exist. So if 10,000 jobs try to access one disk, they may end up uh, going through one individual ethernet cable. There's the router that all of those ethernet cables are um, connected to, but then there is also kind of a, a, um, a, uh, a limitation on the number of connections that can come into uh, a decache pool. Um, so they're, they're referred to as doors, and it may be that there are only a thousand or uh, two thousand open connections into one individual um, uh, decache door um, that are available. But in general, those are bidirectional, and upload and download work exactly the same. It's a good question. Um, so a lot of the things that I've said uh, can be reduced to this very nice uh, summary table. Um, so I have here persistent decache, scratch decache, tape backs, network attached storage data, network attached uh, app, and then your home area. And you can see, you know, one thing to notice is, is like this, this column right here, tape backs. The only one is tape back decache, right? Um, another thing to pay attention to is the retention policy. So persistent is managed by the experiment. Uh, this scratch volume is the least recently used eviction. Um, resilient, um, I'll not talk about, but that's, I believe that's uh, every 30 days. Uh, if you have an access to file, it's uh, removed. The, the tape act is interesting. It is the least recently used eviction from disk. Again, remember, once the file's on tape, it should be on tape forever. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it is going to be on disk and readily available. It, you may have to request that it be staged. Um, another thing that's interesting is quota spaces, right? So there's about 100 terabytes available in persistent. It's a little bit more than that right now for Dune. Um, there is no hard quota, but we do monitor and know who is the largest user and how, how much uh, usage has recently changed. So if you filled up the persistent uh, decache with 30 te terabytes of data, um, we would know who, who had done that and be able to work with you to make sure that you both didn't do that again and that we cleaned up that area so that others could use it. Whereas on the, uh, the data volumes and the app volumes, there are actually uh, uh, hard quotas. So it's about 100 gigabytes on the app volume and about one terabyte uh, on the data volume. And then the overall volume uh, for Dune Data and Dune Data 2 is about 62 terabytes, whereas the Dune app volume is about 15 terabytes. 
So here you can see all the paths over here. Um, and again, the last thing that I want to emphasize uh, is the, whether or not things are grid accessible. Pretty much the only thing that is grid accessible is decache and tape backed. So it is the top half of this table. Dune data and Dune app are not accessible from the grid, nor is your home area. So if you are thinking about um, what your workflow, what your, your bash script is going to be as you submit out onto the grid, whatever happens inside of that script needs to be looking at files that are on decache or staged files from tape back decache. So this is a nice summary table and there's a link to uh, a wiki page that was written out. And so now we're actually gonna get into some commands. Um, Yabi, I have some questions for you um, wow. on the documents. Uh, they, there are some nice activity over there. Uh, what is the difference between Dune Data and Dune Data 2? Um, the number two, that's it. They're exactly the same. Okay. Um, what it was is it's just we wanted a different, uh, there was a, I, I don't know if it was a limitation on the RAID array or if it was a limit on the bandwidth of the server that was um, running out the, uh, the, the RAID array, but they are identical. Okay, and there is also a question, which DKH storage spaces can we access as a user? Uh, all of them. So now that doesn't necessarily mean that you can write to all of the volumes in all of the directories, but uh, you can actually access all of them uh, as a user. Um, just as uh, in any shared resource, um, please make sure that uh, if you are writing to an area that you have uh, authorization to write there. Um, so if uh, you happen to find a directory that says um, slash dune slash production slash uh, proto dune uh, single phase, unless you are part of the production team, you, you probably should not be writing into that directory, um, but you do actually have access to everything, so. We can expect that will be tightened up significantly within the next year, so that can't happen anymore. Which is excellent. I, I, I think that it, it's a much better situation. It would be a much better situation if people can't uh, violate a po policy uh, accidentally. So, yes. Uh, were there other questions? I, I think it's okay for now. And let's, let's go with the exercise because we have 11 minutes uh, left. And, uh, and uh, let's go for, perhaps through one or two exercises. That would be great. Okay. Okay, so um, what we're going to do is we are going to log in um, to the worker nodes. So everyone uh, should have done the, the setup exercises. Uh, I am going to uh, I'm going to play along as well. So I think I'm going to change and share my screen as opposed to um, So I think you can share, see that. So I'm going to run my personal K and it. There we go. Okay, so, and I'm going to run BFSH. Okay. So the question exercise um, from the output of the DF, DF minus H command, minus H being human readable. So the question is, is um, can you identify the home area, the network attached storage spaces and the different decache volumes? So I'm gonna let everybody do this real quick and signify by a thumbs up when you are ready move on i would like users i can see your screen very well and it's, it's quite nice because for those not having a fnatic account they can actually follow a bit but perhaps i would like to know if uh, people can put uh, just right now uh, a problem if uh, they don't see the the terminal correctly in terms of the fonts for me it's okay okay great 
Okay, so we have one thumbs up. Two, three, ah, excellent. Perfect. So it's going up and down. We're getting a lot of people coming through. I think the thumbs up only stays for 10 seconds or so. So, so as it's staying, move quickly. Okay. So I'll go through on my, uh, so I think I can highlight that and you'll see that. So this is the command that I issued, uh, disk free minus H. It tells us the size, how much is used, how much is available and usage percentage. Um, the first ones that you see are the local file systems. Those are the local mounted hard drives. Um, in general, you don't need to necessarily use those. So the home area. So here is the home area right here. It is attached on this server, home server onefnalgovernor That's one of the ways that you know that you're dealing with a network attached storage is that it has that server in front of it. And then it says slash home. So it's 2.9 terabytes, 2.5 terabytes is used. It's 87% full. Again, one of the things to remember is you don't have that much space there. So you should just really be putting scripts. Looking for other network, <clears throat> excuse me, other network attached storage spaces. You can look at all of these right here. We've got Dune data, new soft data, Dune data two, um, some, some Fermilab specific uh, um, network attached storage that's for the, the service providers uh, within scientific computing division, new soft, and then the Dune app. And here you can see actually one of the interesting things, how old these volumes are. It Back before Dune was Dune, it was LBNE. And we were also considering Water Cherenkov. Uh, so this is the LBNE Water Cherenkov app. Um, it has not changed, the name on the mount point has changed, but uh, the underlying volume has it. And then looking for PNFS volumes, here are some of the ones that are, the, excuse me, decache volumes, which are mounted under the PNFS um, here. So you have Larsoft, LBNE, Mars, Dune. So that's how you can look to see all of those different mounts. Now, um, one of the things that we want to teach you is um, data handling commands. Um, because as I've mentioned, um, access to these large storage volumes, there are limitations, um, both on the, um, the number of connections, but then also limitations on some of the software that is available. Some is a little bit more delicate and some is much more robust. And so we wanna teach you some of the robust mechanisms that you can use to um, uh, access uh, the storage elements. Uh, so I'm gonna drop that back a little bit. So IFDH is the Intensity Frontier Data Handling uh, tool set. Um, and this is one of the, the common commands that you'll come across. Um, it facilitates selecting the appropriate data transfer method from all of the many possibilities while at the same time protecting shared resources from overload. Um, you, you may see this as IFDHC. The C refers to a client, so it's Intensity Frontier Data Handling Client. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to start out with a, an example command that will show you how to copy a file from uh, tape back to dcache and copy it to DevNull. Uh, does, does everyone know what DevNull is? Uh, if not, um, DevNull is also referred to as the bit bucket. It's the trash can of the computer. Anything that is copied to DevNull is just deleted and gone. So we are going to copy a file uh, and stream it into the bit bucket um, and go from there. So what you will do is you can log in. You will have need to have gone through the mission setup so that you have a specific Dune TPC version, um, but you can just follow this along these commands and I will do the same. Um, except oh, that's because I got logged out. 
I got I got logged out because I'm tethered to my phone. I put on the chat the, the June TPC version for those who did not do the setup or who are, they don't have exported that variable that will make up for the second line. So here is, uh, yeah, there's an example of how you can set that up. Uh, if, yeah. So v09 underscore 22 underscore 02. If someone can talk, copy that into the chat, that would be great. So what we're doing is we're just kind of setting up the environment for so that IFDH is in our shell environment. The next thing that I do is I set up FNAL security. This makes sure that I have a good Kerberos ticket, that I have a, um, a, a grid proxy generated from, from that uh, so that I have uh, something that I can authenticate with in order to access. So the last command that I'm going to do is this. And to talk about the format of this command, the first thing is, is that I am issuing saying, I want you to run the program IFDH. So that is a binary and an executable. Um, I want you to do this, the copy command. And then I give a source. And then I give a destination. And in this case, I'm copying from specifically, if I look right here, Dune tape max decache. I'm copying out this, this, copying this file that is output from the Proto Dune single phase production two campaign. And I'm copying it to DevNull um, because, well, we don't want to generate extra copies of it, but we just want to give an example of how you could do that. Now, IFDH has a lot of commands. Um, so while I showed you IFDHCP, there are also things, uh, IFDHRM, uh, IFDH, um, uh, make directory, uh, IFDH move, all of those commands you can see right here. So here's this first one, IFDHCP, and then the arguments, but then there are a lot of other ones. Some of the ones that I want to highlight real quick are these right here. So Dcache is not a POSIX volume. And so if you wanted to, to achieve some of the POSIX commands that you might be familiar with, an LS, an, a, a move, an RM, or a make directory, instead of trying to use those commands in the shell directly, if you use IFDH, it is a much more stable and robust um, command to use because it uses a better protocol to talk with Dcache um, uh, as opposed to trying to force things through POSIX, which it, it's an unstable connection. So you can see that you've got IFDH MV, which is move, IFDH LS, which is listing the directory, make directory, RM, RM directory, and more. So knowing that information, there's now a second exercise, which is kind of four things. What we want to do is we want to create a directory in your scratch area. We want to copy your bash RC file to that directory. Um, and then copy the .bash RC file from your scratch directory to dev null. And then finally remove the directory. So I'm going to try and play along. Ooh, we're now out of time. I'm sorry. OK. It's okay, Kirby. You can you can go a bit five minutes because I was finishing earlier my part. So I go ahead for the exercise too. Well, I'll show you. I, I want to create a directory in my scratch area. So I'm going to ifdh make directory dfs dune scratch users Kirby, and I'm going to. Like that. Now I can also list that directory, see what's inside of there. And there's nothing. So, um, but I can do copy. RC.
believe that's correct. I hope that's correct. And it's successful. Now, one of the things that I want to emphasize and it is included in here, if this, this de destination with IFDH, you need to give the full path. So if you notice, I didn't just give the directory, I gave the directory and the name of the file. If I wanted to give just the directory, then what I could do is something like this. Now, now is when this may backfire on me because I can't remember if minus D is all the way beginning all of the arguments or not. Beginning. Yeah, thank you. Now I'm getting an error because the file already exists, which is okay. So I'm just gonna stop. But now the question I wanna do IFTHCP from, Oh, Ken has raised his hand. Yes, Ken. Yes, so there is an important other thing to note here in the error output. See what happens when Mike gets the failure, right? It tells you, oh, okay, file exists. And then what happens after that? Notice it retries. Now, by default, IFDH will retry several times with an ever increasing delay. I think the default is it retries five times or something, right? The first time it delayed four seconds. The next time it delayed 39 seconds. And if he had left this up, it would have been even longer. The same thing will happen in your jobs. If you try to overwrite a file that already exists or you try to copy in a non-existent file or something like that, uh, by default, you will get stuck in this retry loop and then your job just sits there blocking a slot, doing something that's never going to succeed, right? So be careful of that. And there's an environment variable you can set to limit the number of retries, which we highly recommend. We'll go over that tomorrow, but just yeah. something to keep in mind. So here's an example. I copied out of Dcache scratch and then copied it to dev null. I now want to clean up what I've done. And so now I'm going to So uh, thumbs up or thumbs down if you think this this command is going to succeed. Nobody's voting. They are thinking, perhaps. Actually, uh, perhaps it will help because I think that uh, someone that was asking on the document, what is the difference between IFDH, MKDR, and MKDR? Uh, are the difference between what? Between the command IFDH, MKDR, and the command MKDR. Ah, one uses, a, they use a different protocol. So um, one accesses either through XRD D or um, grid FTP. Uh, and those are a ve very robust connections. Um, they will work on any worker node, any interactive node, basically any computer that you might have access to within the high energy physics domain. IFDH command, if it's in your, if, if, it, if that command is available, it will function and work. Whereas the just plain uh, MK deer is trying to go through POSIX and is going across uh, a Chimera PNFS mount, and that is unstable and often will cause problems. So um, I, I, can, I can't emphasize enough how much I would discourage you from using the normal POSIX commands and instead using the IFDH commands because you will end up in the habit of, um, you'll end up in the habit of using the same tool interactively that can be used in your grid jobs. So, so one person voted down, uh, this command is gonna fail because the directory is not empty. 
So instead, I need to do this. Great, now I've deleted that. And now I can delete that. So we walked through that. Um, talking about the thing that I mentioned earlier about um, uh, having access to um, either the POSIX commands or the IFDH commands. Um, one of the things that, that I mentioned was talking about XRD. So XRD is the extended root daemon, and it's a software framework designed for accessing data from various architectures in a completely scalable way. So um, you can use it on one individual node, but you can also use it on um, 100,000 jobs that are out running on the Open Science Grid or the WLCG. Um, at the same time, uh, we have the directories that we are used to, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they um, that we can use those directories within an extra D because extra D wants to know, ah, I'm going to connect over the network, tell me what server I'm going to connect to, and then tell me the directory on that server. So one of the nice tools that we have is PNFS to extra D. So if I type in this command, So here's the input command right here, and then here is the output command. And what it's telling me is that if I translate this PNFS directory, which is kind of an unstable uh, NFS mount, I can access it through the root, root uh, server. Uh, um, this root server right here, FNDCA1 and port 1094, and on that server in this directory right here. So then I can do an interesting thing, uh, which is this next command. I am just going to, I just deleted the Dune tutorial, so I'm not going to look for that directory. But if I want to do this, now all of a sudden I have an ls through x or d, which is not the same as ifdh, but similar. Both of these are robust and can be used pretty much anywhere. And it tells me that I have three directories in that area. I have output, I have tutorial, and then work. Um, we'll not look and see if work has anything in it at all, because I would prefer to not <laughs> have those comments. Um, but this is a nice example of something where you, you can use the xroot dfs, which is um, xroot d file system command to do tell it, I want this server, I want you to run the command ls, and then the the first argument for that ls command is this is the directory that I would like you to list. Um, so the last exercise that we have is uh, using a combination of IFDH and XRD discussed previously. Um, I want you to locate a file to find the directory for this file. Use PNFSD to get the XRD URI for that file. I, I haven't used URI before. But in general, uh, this right here is the general form for a URI. It has a protocol at the beginning. So HTTPS might be a protocol. Um, this one is X root D, so it's root colon. The server um, to include a port number and then a directory underneath that. So that's what makes up a URI. So to show you how to do these. Uh, So this is a file that's within our, our data storage. It tells me, hey, look, if you want that file, you can go and look in this directory right here. Move this over just a moment. But I don't want to access that directly. I want to access that file through an extra D. So I again, take, do this trick. Ah, great, now I know. Here's my server name and here's my directory. So now I can do an extra DCP. I take that. I put the file name at the end and then I wanna copy that to DevNull. And here we go. <laughs> DevNull exists. 
<laughs> this is why you always do the examples ahead of time. So instead, uh, maybe the best thing that I can do is this. Let me try that. There we go, success. So now the last thing that I wanted us to do was use extra DFS LS to count the number of files in the same directory. So this is where things get a little more interesting. So here I'm gonna do extra DFS. I'm gonna grab this server. So I put that first, that's the first argument. The command I wanted to run, which is LS. And then the directory I'm interested in. If I run that command, I see this huge stream of information. Well, I can't, I don't want to count. I, I'm not going to go back and count all of that. So instead I pipe it into WC, which is a command that counts the words, but I'm going to tell it count the number of lines. And now I know there are 277 other files in that same directory. So those are files that are going to be of a similar format. They're gonna be single phase, fully reconstructed Monte Carlo from Proto Dune single phase prod 4A. And I know that there's at least that much data available, but the great thing is, is that all of this data access, you don't have to do by hand. We have automated tools to do that for you. And that's what Steve's going to talk to you next is how to use those automated data management tools so that you don't have to use these kind of clunky uh, uh, command line options. But at the same time, we wanted to make sure you understood the different data volumes and how if you did need to manually access them, what are the best ways to do that? Um, so I'm going to open up for questions uh, after that last exercise. Thank you so much, Kirby. You don't know that there's been quite a lot of questions on the on the live talk, so uh, uh, this will be quite nice. And I'm sure you will uh, you will have a look later on this. Uh, sure. Yeah. I think that um, as we are running a bit out of time already, um, I, um, I let's go to uh, Steve's uh, presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Kirby, for. Uh, do, giving us a tour on the storage spaces. Thank feel you. Free everyone, and... uh, feel free everyone to thumbs up, uh, especially uh, with the conditions that uh, you're not in your own apartment and tethering on your phone, at least. Uh, I hope you still have uh, a minute on your phones. Okay, great. Um, Steve, Thanks for the questions, everyone. Yep, this, the document is still being uh, filled with questions. So uh, there will be some work uh, uh, post, uh, uh, post lecture on that. 